So I need, we're going to continue to talk about these large scale global winds. And remember the three cell model um, kind of piggybacked off of the single cell model proposed by Hadley. And um, remember, and I'm just going to kind of show you maybe where we left it. Ideally, there are three cells, and this kind of divide each hemisphere kind of into thirds, um, where you have from 0 to 30, you have the Hadley cell, from 30 to 60, you have the, um, the feral cell, and from 60 to 90, you have the polar cell. Well, that's pretty darn simplified. We already talked about one kink is that, um, you know, the idea that uh, the difference between land and large bodies of water. But I also want to tell you that um, the latitude where these cells strike actually will migrate or wander throughout the year, throughout the seasons. As the, as, and we've talked earlier about this, as the Earth orbits the sun, um, it's important, uh, we talked earlier, that um, because the Earth is tilted on its axis of rotation, the directness of the sun's, the latitude on the Earth that gets the line share of the sun's solar radiation changes because of angle. Um, so um, you're going to have to keep all of that in mind. So let me go ahead and show you what I want to say about how um, these global winds are influenced throughout the year. And actually, aside from how global winds are influenced throughout the year, um, one of the other things I still need to talk about is what's happening um, where the air is, what's happening at the surface where that air is descending, where the air between the Hadley cell and the Ferrell cell is descending, and um, what is happening where the air between the Ferrell and the polar cell is ascending. And I've alluded to this already, so it's kind of nice when I'm just kind of reinforcing what you saw earlier on, on a figure, that that band of air between the, um, the Hadley and the Ferrell cell is a, semi, is, a, is a relatively high pressure, and that band of air between the Ferrell and the polar cell is, you know, that we, talk, we call the polar front, is actually kind of an ongoing low. Okay, so what you're going to see on the, the next uh, figure, a couple of figures coming up, is kind of these, how the air swirls in the vicinity of uh, where the, the um, <laughs> where the pole, excuse me, where the Hadley and the Ferrell cell meet. You're going to see where, how the air swirls, and I, what I want you to focus on is that they will swirl, um, since it's a high pressure, you're going to see um, clockwise motion around our high semi-permanent highs and you're going to see counterclockwise um, counterclockwise motion around our semi-permanent lows. Let me show you what I mean. So this is a great figure. It actually shows us several things and uh, first off let me go ahead and draw your attention to the fact that it is showing you um, uh, wind flow, airflow, or wind, uh, for this particular time in January, the month of January. And so these uh, red arrows here are kind of showing you the flow. For instance, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's consistent. For instance, I won't, I won't muck it up too much, but if this is that high, can you see where flow is actually clockwise, uh, which is what we learned about flow around uh, central high pressure in the northern hemisphere due to what the Coriolis force. Um, so the red lines are airflow and the other thing that this is showing you um, is like any good uh, like many good surface maps depending upon what you want to emphasize it's showing you isobars so these gray lines I'm kind of running out of colors um, these gray lines right here are isobars so here we have 1017 millibars um, here we have uh, and get going closer to this high 1020 millibars 1023 millibars it's increasing by uh, increments of three millibars which you know um, Isobaric, uh, I shouldn't say isobaric maps, but um, maps that are showing isobars here like this, um, it depends uh, what increments it needs to increase by relative to um, uh, the pressure gradient that is in place. 
But anyway, let's see what else do I want to highlight about this map. So I already told you it's in January. We're going to see one that's in July coming up here in a minute. Um, I also want to emphasize, do you guys see, and I bet you do, um, this intertropical, I love the intertropical convergence zone. So remember in context of what we've been talking about, the intertropical convergence zone is where the two Hadley cells, one from the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere, butt up against each other. Intertropical convergence zone. And it's kind of fun because can you see... Um, let's see, this would be a good place over here maybe. Can you see where these northeasterly trade winds are converging with this southeasterly trade winds? I just love it. It is so fun. And, but, I guess more to the point of what I've been most recently talking about, can you see here, um, well, I guess, I don't know if you can necessarily see it, but we've been talking about semi-permanent highs. And let me go ahead and show you the semi-permanent high, semi-permanent high, semi-permanent high. And what is that semi-permanent high? It is basically associated with the descending air from the Hadley cell. Okay, so there you go. Um, we have semi-permanent highs in the southern hemisphere. Semi-permanent highs. Okay, so we're kind of marking where the Hadley cell is descending there. Now, notice the intertropical convergence zone, and we're going to talk about this later when we talk about monsoons, but um, check out how it's not at the equator, is it? And I'm getting this really kind of all messed up. I think there's a way to entirely erase all my markings here. But um, uh, notice that the intertropical convergence zone, let me just kind of see if I can highlight if it, the intertropical convergence zone is purple there. It is not along the equator, all right? So with all that mess, that, all that marked up, I guess I do want to show you one more thing. And I don't know what color would be best up here. I'll choose, I'll choose uh, blue. But do you see this Icelandic low? Okay. Well, remember most recently what we've been talking about is that between the feral and the polar cell, we generally have ascending air, and we do have a semi-permanent low there. And that's what that Icelandic low is from. Okay, so I hope this helps. Now, um, uh, look at it closely because I'm going to switch gears from January. I'm going to show you six months later what a similar map looks like in July. Dun dun! dun there's July. <laughs> okay, it's like, and I'm going to show you them side by side here in a minute. But it's it's like it looks like the same map, doesn't it? But look closely, and it's different. And I'll show you them side by side here in a minute. But things we've been talking about. Oh, check out the intertropical convergence zone, the purple line. Okay, and you might already see that boy. It it has moved north. Okay, from where it was. Okay, and this makes sense because actually one of the things we talked about earlier is that as the Earth orbits the Sun at the, um, at the, at the solstices, now I realize that the solstice is in June instead of July, but there's kind of a lag time there between um, when we have our, the, the directness of the rays of the Sun and kind of our, um, our uh, maximum temperature. Uh, but anyway... Um, in the summertime in the northern hemisphere, um, notice where the intertropical convergence zone moves. It moves north, okay? Now, it might be a subtle thing, but actually, can you see where we have actually picked up a new semi-permanent high here? The Bermuda high did not exist in our January scenario. It's a semi-permanent high, but other than that, can you see where we definitely, around this, the um, Bermuda High, we have air moving clockwise, because those red lines are air moving um, uh, wind, basically, um, the way it should in the Northern Hemisphere. So the one of the things I want to emphasize then is basically, can you get a sense for the, and I'll kind of zoom out here again, the fact that um, all three cells three cells in the northern hemisphere, three cells in the southern hemisphere, which I really know as six cells, right? They migrate seasonally. The cells, the entire cells kind of pick up and move. And to me, uh, I, you know, I go back to what Hadley said in 1735, that actually their migration is, can be linked directly to where is that hot spot on the earth. And one of the things we talked about um, 
uh, in a previous segment was how land masses, and I'll kind of highlight um, South America here, how land masses will um, actually affect this kind of idealized three-cell model that we have compared to um, large bodies of water. And that's actually why you're getting these kinks in the intertropical convergence zone. But I wanted to show you that those cells will move seasonally, and as those cells move, so do kind of the surface features of winds and maybe even prevailing weather that we come to know and love about the, ha the, the Hadley cell, the ferro cell, and the polar cell. So as promised, here are those, um, those uh, uh, two uh, maps, one in first in January and the second in July, of um, uh, prevailing winds and the semi-permanent highs and the semi-permanent lows. So I'll kind of let you soak this in, but remember the first one we talked about was in January, and the second one was in, in uh, July. Okay, and can you kind of see the moving, the wandering, I love that word, wandering intertropical convergence zone. That's that purple. Let me kind of zoom in. I don't want to make you dizzy. I love the Pressy app, presentation app, um, but it sometimes does make me dizzy. <laughs> so there's January. Okay, check out the location of the intertropical convergence zone. And here is uh, July not so surprising it is migrating okay and as it migrates let's kind of compare also um, you know where those semi-permanent highs are for instance um, in um, excuse me in January versus July so I don't I just think that is so cool the wandering intertropical convergence zone so isn't this a beautiful um, image and as you can see the only word on here is the or the acronym for the intertropical convergence zone so where that air where the um, let's see the south um, easterly trades are meeting with the uh, northeasterly trades and the air is converging it's rising it's hitting the tropopause and that unstable air if it's moist enough, which uh, over the oceans you would figure lots of moisture, we have condensation and uh, clouds, maybe even storms uh, there. But um, so this is our beautiful blue planet, uh, water planet, and you can see the band of clouds here um, where the intertropical convergence zone is. Notice it's nice and straight, it's all over. Um, water right there. I kind of cheated a little bit because I wanted to know what time of year this was and and actually you can make out kind of the break between uh, North America and South America here and so I went back and looked it's most likely that this actually is in July because um, the intertropical convergence zone looks like it's kind of migrated north a little bit. So more on the uh, intertropical convergence zone and actually kind of a seasonal twist to monsoons coming up.